Welcome back to Functional Analysis. And as always, many, many thanks to all the nice people that support this channel on Steady or PayPal. In today's part 17, we talk about the Azela Ascoli theorem. Since we've already learned what compact sets are, this theorem fits in here perfectly. It will tell us how we can characterize compact sets in an infinite dimensional function space. Before starting with the theorem, I want to sensitize you to the meaning of compact sets in Banach spaces. For example, if we have a norm space where x is a finite dimensional vector space, then we know this is always a Banach space. However, more interesting for us is now there the compactness is characterized by the closeness and the boundedness. Please keep in mind that we have already learned that in general metric spaces, only the implication from left to right is correct. Indeed, this is what we have in an infinite dimensional normed space. So let's look at such an example. And I choose the LP space with the P norm for P less than infinity. There we also have learned this is a Banner space. Now let's look at the closed unit ball in LP. This should be the set of all vectors x that fulfill that the norm is less or equal than 1. So let's give it the name A as well here and you immediately see it's a closed and bounded set. In order to show that it is not compact, we have to write down a sequence in A that has no convergent subsequence. Now what we can do in infinite dimensional space is to go in an infinite number of directions. First we could go in the x1 direction, which means we have a 1 here and then only zeros. So this is one chosen element in a set A. And I want to give it a good fitting name E1. With this you already know what E2 should be. It's simply the unit vector which points in the x2 direction. Of course we can continue this procedure and define E3, E4 and so on. Now we can forget for a moment that a vector looks like this and just consider the sequence of vectors. This means that we now have one chosen sequence in A. Of course, the question we should ask here is, can this sequence have a convergent subsequence? The answer is indeed no, because we can easily calculate the distance between two members of the sequence. It would be zero if n is equal to m, so let's calculate the whole thing for n unequal to m. So we have the pth root and inside we add the absolute values of the entries to the power p. However, most of them are just zeros. We have only two positions where something happens. We have one position with a one and another one with a minus one. Hence in the pth root, we have the absolute value of one to the power p plus the absolute value of minus one to the power p. So we just have the pth root of two. Now please note, this works for all n and m as long as they are not chosen as the same number. This means that going to a subsequence won't change that you always have the same distance between two members. It does not matter which value this number has exactly, it's greater than zero and it's the same number for all nm. So we conclude we can't find a convergent subsequence. Therefore, the closed unit ball in this Banner space is not compact. Indeed, with a similar argument, you can show for Banner spaces, the closed unit ball is compact if and only if the Banner space is finite dimensional. This then tells us for an infinite dimensional Banner space, being closed and bounded is never enough for being compact. The Azela Ascoli theorem now tells us which information we have to add for the Banner space given by the continuous functions. So let's look at the continuous functions defined on the unit interval together with the supremum norm, which is of course defined as the supremum over all possible outcomes measured in the absolute value. Please don't forget the function has values in our number field f. So we deal with the real and the complex case simultaneously as always. However, the best visualization for this would always be to look at the graph of the function f and then the norm of the function f should be the biggest distance you find from the x-axis. Now I don't want to show you all the details, but it's a good exercise to show that this is indeed a Banach space. Another important property you might know from these continuous functions is that they are also uniformly continuous. Since it's not the simplest definition, I want to write it down here. 
and we will use the epsilon delta characterization for continuity. This is something you should know, at least for common functions as we have it here. To make it easier to see what really happens, I want to use the quantifiers for all and it exists. In addition, to make it easier to read, I will write the corresponding elements below. Now for all epsilon greater zero, there exists a delta greater zero, such that for all t1, t2 from zero one, we have the following. If the distance between t1 and t2 is less than delta, then this implies that the distance between the images is less than epsilon. This is stronger than the normal continuity at each point because this delta here works for all t1, t2 at the same time. Therefore we say the continuity works uniformly. Now we have a fact you might know, if we have the continuous functions on a compact interval, then they are also uniformly continuous. Now let's go one step deeper into the topic and look at a whole subset of continuous functions. So we have a whole family of functions we call A and now we want a notion of continuity that works uniformly in the set A. And this is something we call then uniformly equicontinuous. Since it sounds stronger than the thing we had before, I just want to show you where we need to change the formula from above. Now, when you see this formula, you might notice that we also need a quantifier for this function f, otherwise it doesn't make any sense. Therefore, the correct question is where to put this quantifier. Of course, we can argue in the same way as before, we wanted that the delta works for all the points here at the same time. And now the chosen delta should also work for all the functions from A at the same time. Therefore, I put the quantifier for all F in A after the delta quantifier. In other words, this means we can choose the delta independently of the function F and this still holds. And this property for the whole set A we call equicontinuous. Now, after understanding where the long formula with the quantifiers comes from, we can simplify this into a shorter formula. Going through all the f here is of course equivalent to saying that the supremum over f of this number is less than epsilon. And the epsilon delta gadget we used before can be translated into a limit process. This means the supremum has to go to zero if the distance between t1 and t2 goes to zero. Okay, I guess it might be very helpful looking at some examples. First, let's look at a counterexample which shows us that the unit ball is not equicontinuous. So the set A is all the continuous functions with supremum norm less or equal than 1. For a counterexample, it's sufficient to write down an estimate for the supremum here, which means we choose some suitable functions f. And then we know the supremum has to be larger or equal than the supremum we calculate. For the functions we want to consider, I just give you a short sketch. If I give you a function that does a jump here at 1 half, then you know this is not continuous, it's not in our space. However, we can repair that just by connecting these two parts here, for example, in such a way. In this example here, the linear part has length of 1 over 4. Therefore, I want to denote the corresponding function by f4. Of course, we can do the whole procedure for all other numbers, 1 over 5, 1 over 6, and so on. Hence, I want to do this for 1 over n. And then we get a whole sequence of continuous functions. Since the supremum norm for all of these functions is 1, they lie in A and we have our estimate for the supremum. The reason why we constructed these functions in such a way is simply because now we can calculate this difference here when t1 and t2 are close together. Please don't forget, the limit we have written down here means you have to look at all possibilities of t1 minus t2 as long as the difference goes to 0. Here we get our two points, this should be t2 and 1 half should be t1. With this choice, we don't need a supremum here at all, we can just look at all the fn's separately. Now the picture says it all, this is exactly 1 for all n. However, now we have one case where t1 minus t2 is 1 over n, so this goes for n to infinity to 0, but the supremum on the left hand side can't go to 0 because it's always bigger than 1. Of course, you could do the same thing using the original definition and maybe that's a good exercise for you. Nevertheless, the conclusion should be the same, A is not equicontinuous. 
Okay, so let's do a positive example now. Again, f should be a subset of the continuous functions, and now every function there should be continuously differentiable. This means that f prime makes sense, and that this is also a function in our Banach space. Hence, we can look at the supremum norm, and I want that to be less or equal than 2. Then we can take a function f from a and calculate the difference of the images. And here, knowing that f is continuously differentiable, we can apply the mean value theorem. So it's less or equal than f prime at a position between t1 and t2, and usually you call it psi, times the difference between t1 and t2. Now, knowing that the supremum norm of f prime is less or equal than 2, we know that this thing is always less or equal than 2. Hence, we get a better estimate out here, which is 2 times t1 minus t2. Now, for the next step, we can just apply the supremum on the left-hand side and get the same estimate. So we can conclude, if we apply all possible limits that have that t1 minus t2 tends to 0, then this also tends to 0. Therefore, by definition, this set A is now equicontinuous. Okay, maybe I'll leave it with two examples for the term uniformly equicontinuous and now start with our famous Arzela Ascoli theorem. Finally, we can state the theorem which holds in our Banner space of continuous functions. So let's take a subset A again that is compact. Now the claim is this is indeed equivalent for A being closed and bounded and uniformly equicontinuous. And with this, we have the missing third ingredient for having the equivalence here for this infinite dimensional Banach space. Please recall, the problem in an infinite dimensional Banach space for the compactness was that we have too many directions. The theorem now tells us that we still can have infinitely many directions in the compact set, but with a constraint hidden in the equicontinuity here. Now you should remember, the arzela ascoli theorem always deals with continuous functions. Nevertheless, we can generalize the statement I gave you here. In fact, the unit interval here is not important, you can choose any compact set. Moreover, you can even substitute this with an abstract metric space as long as it is compact in itself. In this case, the notion of equicontinuity translates as everything else from the numbers to metric spaces. In the next videos you will see why this theorem is so interesting, especially when we deal with linear operators defined on this Banner space. So therefore, I really hope I see you there. With this, thanks for listening and thanks for all the support. Bye.